right, back down at the Chief's Pit with Timmy Petty, Mark Petty, and Richie Petty. And we found some old tapes of our grandfather. And it's kind of exciting for us to sit back and listen to. And I hope you all get some enjoyment out of it. But you always hear people when we talk about going to eat lunch with grandfather. And this kind of listening to these tapes reminds me of going to eat with him because these are the stories he would tell us, ain't it? Yeah, and uh, to add to some of that stuff, you know, it, it, I've kind of previewed what you're going to talk about here, but I just remember him like if he was rolling something around and was making a fuss, you know. And that's, that's why he'd say, hey, Sonny, can't you hear that thing making a fuss? And then that's when he'd go into the grease is the secret to life. And, you know, he had all kinds of them little one-liners. Oh, yeah. But this is going to be kind of neat because he's talking about when he's growing up a little bit. And then he's talking about when he first started racing and running the beach course. So there's a little bit more to share as we go, but I was excited to find these. I like, was only thinking there was eight of them, but he, there's 11. Well, the, the, right? the, the well, brothers and sisters, yeah, yeah all of them. The, the Lee Petty stories, you kind of got to read between the lines. Cause, <laughs> no, but like he, I remember him telling us these stories, and, and these tapes are very similar to those stories, like he said, but it's like you heard him. But then years later, you look back and say, wait a minute, that old man was... He was on it. You thought, but he he didn't. He he went straight to the point, told you what was on his mind, and he said, I ain't telling you I'm right or wrong. This is just my experiences. Right. And that's kind of what we're fixing to share with you Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Oh, so, yeah. But I'm like Richie. It reminds me of the times when you'd go to lunch or just be around the shop or whatever, and he'd tell you stories and or give you a lesson and you yep. didn't realize what was going on, but you look back on it, and again, he's right. And it was hard to pin him down because he wouldn't stay in one spot at one time. <laughs> so he'd give you a little bit, and he'd come back and give you another. And this is kind of where this is going to go because it's kind of pieced together some old tapes. And it's it's really got some wisdom in there if you really listen close. <laughs> I think one of my greatest motivators, uh, stuff that he said, and, you know, like I said, you hear him and Daddy talking to you all the time. It's just part of getting old, but... You know, one of, the, one of the things that he, he said to me is, Sonny, there ain't nobody going to do it for you. And I, I, I hear that every day, and I kind of live by it and die by it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Don't wait on somebody to do it mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, but, and some of these are the same thing. I mean, it's like, it's almost like he, he printed these off for Oh, it is. It is. R Richie talking about not being able to pin him down. <laughs> but what about you? All right, so you'd be in the shop working, and uh, you, grandfather had a schedule. Yep. And you yep. could kind of keep up with it. But he didn't ever come in the same door. No, he'd sneak up on you. <laughs> and you'd be sitting there working, thinking, well, it's about time for Lee Boy. And you'd be looking out for him. And then somebody would be behind your back saying, what you looking for, Sonny? <laughs> <laughs> he's already there. Yeah, he's pretty sneaky. Yeah. But, yeah, well, wasn't sneaky. He's just paying attention. Oh, yeah. And and what was y'all doing that one time out there? And you heard him coming. And you started rattling on something. I was up in the old shop. Beating on it. With <laughs> oh, yeah. We was, we, was, we was out in the shop, supposedly working. <laughs> And him and Dad was in the office, and we was just kind of throwing wrenches on the ground and hammering a little bit, <laughs> make it sound like we was doing something. We was, we was, yeah, wasn't doing what we was supposed to. Well, then he doing? got ready to leave, and he yeah, come out there and he said, going he said, boys, he says, y'all... Y'all think you're fooling old Lee boy. He says, yeah. but I know you ain't doing a damn thing but throwing wrenches yeah, up there right. and landing them on the ground. I know the difference. That's exactly right. Well, and he did, didn't he? Hell, he, we, he was we, we, we hope that you can get some enjoyment out of this because we sure do enjoy listening to our grandfather again. We sure do miss him. And, and uh, you know, sit back and relax and learn something here. Like and subscribe. Thanks. To give a good illustration that I had five brothers and I had five sisters who were living in my family. And I remember we was poor as church rats. I don't know how poor that is, but it's awful poor. And uh, my daddy, he was a farmer and a fella did a little bit of odd job, a little bit of this, anything you get to do to make a buck, see what I mean? And so he told us boys, he said, now you, you'll be able to make a living. But you'll be able to make a living with your hands so much. You can do so much with it. Then the next thing you got to do, you got to get people working for you. Well, that'll expand your uh, money making. And said the next best thing, and they'll tell you right today, is buy real estate. That's the best thing a man can do to get ahead. <laughs> I mean, that's what he told me. Century now. 21, right here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, many, how many people that you've seen get rich working with your hands? How many people you've seen get rich and got a few people working for them? How many people you've seen get rich through real estate? <laughs>
Okay, that's nice. Although I'd already been racing on some dirt tracks up in Virginia, Danville, Virginia, and Roanoke, Virginia. You remember going to those, yeah. Richard? Remember going and, up to them? Yeah. Went to Greensboro, Danville, and, and <laughs> Lynchburg. School. Yeah, well, I know when we went to Danville that time, I remember Buck Baker wanted to drive it. I said, man, I worked all summer trying to get this thing ready, and I'm going to let you drive it. Yeah. And I went to Pittsburgh and won it. And, uh, when Pittsburgh won the first race up there and then I come home and I had another race in about six months and about a year or something went back up there and um, Bonnie Flock run into me and turned me over brought it back home put it in a garage we lived over in another place that wasn't a garage it was a barn put it in there and they was going to have a race at Rono and it just looked too bad so I was doing other things too and so I decided I ain't going to do it and about that time my brother come down he said let's take that thing over to Rono we go run there on Friday night, and then go run um, Western Salem on Saturday night. And I won both both of them, so automatically I'm a racer right then. You know what I mean? I've been racing ever since. That was the beginning of ra really running to Plymouth. You know, we had to win and make a buck so we go to the next race, and that's what's called survival. We wouldn't finish or vice versa because he didn't start winning the race until when? Sixty. Sixty. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we had done pretty well established. Daytona Beach and won that first race <laughs> down there. That was arc race, you remember? That was arc race, and yeah. We go down there and them fellas never run a big track and well I had already run them and I told him how to run and everybody wanted to run them tracks when they first started running just as low as they could and back when we first started had to go high as you could and I told him I said now yeah, all, all the way you can beat them fellas they go run low you just go high and you just go right on around them. and now everybody runs low but back when Richard and I started we we run right against the fence, you know what I mean? We'll fit the model Plymouth, and uh, we had to race against each other. Of course, I finished third or fourth or something like that. But there's one fellow down there that had, well, how many tires did he blow, Junior? 80, 80 tires? Some, some 60, 70, something like that. Yeah, blowed 80 tires. It was just <laughs> oh, where, where did he get all the tires? I, I've always thought about it. He had, how did they get that many tires well, in the I, I, I'm going to tell you how I went. Did they I, know they was going to blow that many? I was between here and South Carolina. I stopped down at the service station and bought two new Goodyears. <laughs> that's all, that's I, all you had. That's right? all I had. That's right. <laughs> hey, now, you'd think they, they would, uh, we'd talk about the races that he and I run, that him and him run, and all that stuff. You just, when you sit down at the table, hell, all you think about is eating. Yeah, and just <laughs> trying to set up an automobile, and they're sitting the front end this way and the front end that way. They set it up exactly like I did in 1950 Model Plymouth. Ain't no different. You got to have four wheels on the ground. You got to have four tires on the ground. You got to have four springs. Track is efficient. They know how, but you could do only so much to make a race car if that driver ain't willing to drive it. Well, you just also ran hundred thousand dollars to get the car there, <laughs> and it never did cost me anything back then because we didn't even take the lights out. We drove the car to the racetrack. We bought gas on the road. Get to the racetrack. Well, we pull the lights out and put it, take the muffler off, and go racing. We raced and went all the way to drove all the way to California, the race car, and then raced it out there and raced it back. Drove it back. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I think I think okay, I think uh, Dale uh, and Morris must have raced till they yeah, had some wheels come off. And stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, with the television and everything, well, everybody so. knows everybody. You know what I mean? Uh, we didn't. Uh, when I started racing, we didn't hardly have a radio. You know what I mean? And they talk about getting some of the pictures uh, when we first started racing. Hell, yeah, didn't nobody have a Kodak? <laughs> Take no pictures. <laughs> I go to the junkyard and I buy some heavy wheels, racing wheels, and I put on that on that car. And now what you do, you put heavy wheels on it, but you got to manufacture the manufacturer. The manufacturer, that's you exactly. know what I mean. You got manufacturers that manufacture every part on that race car. Where well, we used to have to do it ourselves as a race yeah. driver and as a race uh, owner. owner rest of a week and pick up parts bolts and nuts and things now then people comes around and supplies all you need <laughs> that's a hell of a lot of difference <laughs> before they ever built the Tona Beach down there we running a road course down there on the asphalt two miles down two miles up to asphalt two miles on the sand and a quarter mile in each turn which are four and a half miles see what I mean four I think down on the road course but the first time I went down there with a little Plymouth and they were sort of like a, a bulldog with a rabbit you know what I mean I didn't have much of a change because the car wouldn't run very fast 
And old Bill Francis, he kept coming to me. He said, I'm going to build me a big track over here, over there close to the airport. I said, Bill, what you talking about? And one of them was swamp. I mean, hell, it was swamp and, and trees and those. It just, over all of where that business and office and racetrack is now, it wasn't nothing but swamp. I mean, swamp on top of swamp. And so he kept on insisting. He kept telling me he's going to build one. I said, well, yeah, I don't believe you can do it. Well, that went on through three or four, five years. First thing I know, I seen the tractors and things over there working. I asked him one day, what you going to do? He said, I'm going to build me a racetrack over there, the best racetrack in the world. And that was the uh, beginning of Daytona Beach, as far as I'm concerned. And where he got the finance to do it, I don't know, but he got it. You know? And so it's been a phenomenon for NASCAR or for racing of all the tracks that have ever been built. It's the most bleed track of all tracks that's ever been run, except in Annapolis. Of course, Indianapolis has been there, and they've done run there, done run out on Indianapolis. So that throws Daytona Beach first right now.